Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Hills Are Silent podcast. I'm Two Tone the Artist. And I'm Mr. Peach. And on this podcast, we like to chit 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 chop it up about the video games of yesterday, today, and days in the future. Let's rock, y'all. All right, Mitch. We talk about Resident Evil way too much on this podcast. I mean, it's funny. We're called the Hills Are Silent podcast, but we seem to lean a little more towards Resident Evil than Silent Hill. At least it seems that way as of lately. So, I want you to let everybody know what game you just finished up. Yeah, this is one we we have touched on a little bit, and uh, which kind of uh, prompted me to play it. But I am I just finished Resident Evil Code Veronica. And be- before you dive in, Code Veronica was released on a lot of consoles. Where did you play it? Yes, I was going to. Yes, I played it on the Xbox 360. So it is the HD version of Code Veronica. All right. And honestly, it was probably the the best place to play it right now and overall thoughts before i dive too into the specifics absolutely loved it i think it's one that everyone needs to play even though it's an xbox 360 title or older if you play the other editions it still holds up really well to this day and it plays you know it plays like the older Resident Evil's play and it. it's it's fantastic but there, there's some differences there's so much i want to say and i, I don't want to I want to take my time on this, but I think it if I had to rank it, I think it would be right under two remake now. But if they did a re a remake like they did with two, it would definitely be at the top. What about where does it rank on your scale? Man, as I've said before, it depends what day you ask me. Some days I might tell you Resident Evil 2 is my favorite Resident Evil game. Some days I might tell you Code Veronica. It just depends on the mood I'm feeling. And Capcom, you really, really need to remake this game. You should not have skipped this entry. You should not have gone from Resident Evil 3 straight to remaking Resident Evil 4. Like, how are you going to skip Code Veronica? Sure, it may not be as well known as Resident Evil 4, but man, in the eyes of, of Resident Evil fans, it is like a cult classic. How could you skip it? So hopefully the remake is still on the horizon, but we'll see. Yeah, and I'll tell you why in a little later why I don't think they're going to do it. But to, I guess, to piggyback off of what you were saying, it, it has very important story elements. So, I mean, like, after playing it, I know I was telling you, I was like, I really think that should have been a numbered game. Like, I don't think that should have been what they considered a spinoff, because there's a lot of important story in that that you get from from playing through it. Just to give a, a quick summary to people who haven't played it, uh, Claire is the, the main protagonist for majority of the game, but you also play as Chris for Redfield as a part of the game. You start off, Claire has been captured. She was trying to infiltrate a Paris laboratory of Umbrella Corp. She got captured. She then got sent to an island, which is called Rockfort Island. And once she got to Rockfort Island, she essentially gets a, I mean, zombies are overrunning that island and she's trying to escape while also trying to find her brother, Chris. And a lot of stuff happens along the way that I won't spoil. Yeah, it's weird. It gets really weird. And there's a lot of twists and turns. Just, yeah, just bizarre, bizarre writing. Yeah, and to, again, to build off of that, the bizarre writing is why I think they will not do any sort of remake for it it seems like nowadays resident evil wants to take themselves very seriously in my opinion and a lot of code veronica is not very serious it's like borderline cringe at some points but i love it like it's like so steve steve is one of the characters who at first i thought was going to be a really annoying character i was like oh my god like i don't know if i could take this guy's voice throughout the entire game but as the story progresses and him and Claire's relationship builds and like certain things happen, he, I started to really love Steve as a character. And when I say that there's some cringy moments and a bit of uh, a bit of cheesy writing, the part that sticks out to me is Steve is trying to get into a getaway vehicle and get out of uh, 
I think it was the Antarctica portion uh, where he's trying to get in the vehicle and get out. Well, in the process of doing that, he's checking out Claire. I don't know if he's checking out her ass or whatever the heck. He's he's basically being a little perv and eyeing her and not paying attention to what he's doing. He ends up hitting a um, hitting a, a pipe of some sort. And a bunch of toxic gas starts filling up inside the entire room. <laughs> So just ridiculous things like that happen. Um, and then uh, along the lines of that, I think we talked a little bit about but one of the main protagonists is a is a cross dressing sister lover who uh, who is actually a really interesting character. And I thought he play, it was a, it was a very fun role, but it just something that's just very not Resident Evil nowadays or even, you know, it was very much different from the rest of the numbered series. Yeah. Yeah. But go ahead. I was just gonna say, um Yeah, when Code Veronica first came out, so it first released on the Sega Dreamcast, I think way back in like nineteen ninety nine or two thousand. And that console didn't do very well, so Capcom ended up re releasing it for PlayStation two as Code Veronica X. Now, I played the Dreamcast version, but I think it's the PlayStation 2 version that I actually ended up beating. And they changed just a few things. I think it had a little bit better graphics, and there's a few scenes that they changed. But I don't really think one version is better than the other. They're, for the most part, they're, they're very similar. And then, as Mitch said, it was re-released as an HD version on both Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 with pretty much the only thing they did was give it higher resolution and widescreen support. But other than that, it's the exact same graphics as the PlayStation 2 version. But anyway, yeah, carry on. Yeah, I want to go into, so campaign-esque, story-esque, excellent. I was captivated the whole time i loved every part of that story the goofy writing and everything was fantastic with it along with the certain serious elements of like when you know when you meet when you link up with wesker and in, in certain points it was fun as well but gameplay wise i think for everybody who does want to play this game i think it's very very important that you realize that it is pretty difficult and i think for me at least the most difficult single player resident evil that I have ever played. It is 100% tank controls. There's, you know, it it is only an HD version. As Mike said, they didn't do anything else to it, but uh, enhance the graphics. So the tank controls took me a little bit to get used to again, but I, I started to get the hang of it pretty quickly. So that wasn't too much of a problem. I think where most of the problems lie and kind of uh, I'm glad I talked to you prior to playing is really like saving your ammo and health, especially that first half of the game. I got in trouble because I know we were texting back and forth. I got in trouble when I went to the tyrant fight. You fight tyrant, who is a villain in Resident Evil 2, halfway through the game. It's basically the halfway point of the game. And you really need to have some certain ammo to take him out because it's very difficult to kind of run around him and I guess stay alive for very long and I didn't have what I needed so I made it work I found I had enough of some other of the I guess they had the bow rounds what they were called and those were those got me through it but it was a little more difficult than if I had the explosive arrows that I was supposed to have yeah, and that's that's an issue with a lot of old games, but definitely this game. As you can basically play yourself into a corner where you're screwed and you can't beat the game because you made too many mistakes early on in the game and now you don't have enough health, don't have enough ammo to actually finish the game. And on two separate occasions, I've beaten this game several times, and on two separate occasions... I screwed myself over and could not finish the game and had to completely start over. Well, one time I had to completely start over. I ended up at, I think the first time you battle, uh, what's the main 
the 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 main villain, the sister's name. What, what's her name again? Uh, Alexia. Alexia. Yeah. The first time you battle her, I was when I was Chris. All I had was yes. a knife. Oh. <laughs> so there was no way I was gonna beat a boss battle with zero ammo and just a knife. And I tried. I tried. I kept reloading the save. I'm like, maybe I can, maybe I can actually pull this off. And eventually, I had to just accept it that I screwed up. I only kept one save file and I had to start all the way over. So when I replayed the game years later, I then knew what you should do with any old game is keep multiple save files that you keep alternating between. So if you screw yourself over, you can go back a little bit of a distance. And and all actually speaking of the tyrant, I did the same thing. I ended up fighting him on the plane and I had I did not have enough ammo to, to beat him. Yeah. So I had to load up a way earlier save and just be super conservative with my ammo and just run past as many ammo or enemies as I could without shooting them. And then I'd managed to to come back like way, way more prepared and was able to beat them super easily. Yeah, thankfully I took your advice on multiple saves and I'm usually, a, I usually do that as well with older games, but I reloaded to Tyrant Fight 1 and I changed my strategy on what I use with Tyrant Fight 1 to help me get through Tyrant Fight Two, and that what is what helped me get through it when I was struggling and didn't have the ammo for it. So that that helped. But it was funny because I was like looking up a guy when I thought I was screwed. I was like, oh man, I'm gonna look up a guy and see if anybody has any tips or tricks that I that I'm just not seeing. And there's so many people that are like, I have ten bullets, I have one herb. Am I screwed? <laughs> and everybody's just like, yeah, yeah, you're screwed, dude. You got to start over. You are, man. Uh... Yeah, I absolutely love this game. I've got the the HD version on PlayStation 3. I've got a, a PlayStation 2 version, the copy of that. I would love to also have the Dreamcast version in my collection, but I think that's going for like 100 bucks right now on oh, wow. the used market and yeah, I'm not dropping 100 bucks on that. Uh, but okay. what a lot of people don't know is there was a spin-off game called Gun Survivor 2 Code Veronica that was released in arcades and on PlayStation 2 years ago but it was only released on PlayStation 2 in Europe and Japan we didn't get the game over here uh, in the US so I had bought and imported a copy of that because I gotta. I love Resident Evil. I gotta have a complete Resident Evil collection. I may not have like every variation of every game, but you best believe like I've got a copy of every game they released on some console. Yeah. So when I found out there was a Code Veronica game, no less, that I had never played, I was like, I gotta get that. So the difference is, is this game is a rail shooter. So it's like the House of the Dead or Time Crisis yeah. or something like that where you're not actually controlling your camera. It's just taking you through the levels and then you have to shoot the enemies on screen with a light gun. That's interesting. And I never never beat it. Played maybe an hour of it. It wasn't that great. But it basically is just, yeah, trying to recreate Code Veronica as a rail shooter so one of these days I should sit down and finish it. The problem was I didn't have a light gun at the time um, because I imported it. It would not work on my U.S. PlayStation 2 console. So I had to play it through emulation on the PC and I was stuck with just a controller. Okay. But maybe at some point I'll get a fancy setup where I can somehow still play it with uh, the light gun. Actually, I take that back. I now should be able to play that with a light gun because I've got a modded PlayStation 2 which will allow me to play the Japanese game on my US console. I just picked up a CRT television hey. so that I can play light gun games again. So I actually could load this up on my PlayStation 2 and use my vintage GunCon 2 light gun for the PlayStation 2 and actually crank nice. through this game. All right. Looks like Mike has some homework for. Yeah, uh, man. Just light bulb came on in my head. I'm like, wait a minute. I can actually go through this now. So I may have to play through that this weekend. Yeah. To to wrap up the code, Veronica talk before we move on. Uh, 
as I said, it was it was very hard, and there were a lot of times where you know I I died on parts where I'm like, oh crap, I used too much ammo, or I did, did something that I I need to restart. But even every time I restarted or died or whatnot, it, it it wasn't one of those where I got super frustrated very often. I was kind of just like, I knew what I was expecting going in, but I was enjoying the game and the story so much, it just it didn't bother me at all. And that's rare to say when I when I'm dying a bunch in a game, <laughs> but yeah, all in all excellent game it's it's probably number two on my on my list now i'm i know we had our ranking back then and the seven was at my top but seven is slowly working its way down as i'm playing more and more of these uh these games that i have not played myself before so yeah excellent game highly recommend play the remake of two first i'm trying to do them like in order of story and i i'm going two, then code veronica i know three Part of three is before two, but then part of three is after Code Veronica and two. So it's probably the next one. But yeah, great game. Highly recommend it. All right, man. And the graphics were really good for the PlayStation 2. They may not look great now, but when that game first came out, that was a really good looking game. Yeah, and the HD one on 360 ran great. I had no issues. It, you know, the cut, the nostalgic cutscenes were there. I mean, it. It, it was great. All good. Yeah. All right. Well, the only thing I've been playing lately is Need for Speed 2 for PlayStation 1. If I remember correctly, this game came out in 1997. So I was playing it the other night. My fiance walked in the room and she's like, that must be an old game. She took one look at the screen, <laughs> saw those blocky graphics. She's like, whoa, that looks old. So, I've been on a collecting kick for Need for Speed as well, and Need for Speed 2 was one of the few games left in the series that I did not have. So I picked up a copy of it for I think like $15 at a used video game store. I was like, alright man, let me jump in. I know I've played it years ago, when I was a kid, back when it first came out. But I don't remember it at all. So jumping in... Oh, and I just recently played Need for Speed 1, so that was fresh in my mind. So Need for Speed 2 is a huge leap from Need for Speed 1. And mind you, I'm talking about the PlayStation versions, not the PC versions. They're they're quite different. But it, it's so interesting to me that old games, like all the skeleton of the game is there that still exists to this day. Like the Need for Speeds now have they're great they're they're way way far advanced in technology but they all the core features were there from the get-go from need for speed one and need for speed two so just i mean you 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 could drift in the game which i for some reason i was like you can't drift in the old need for speed games no you can't and they have different levels taking place in different places of the world um really cool cars and what i liked about older games that isn't really a thing anymore is it used to go to the main menu and they'd have like start game multiplayer options and then they would have an extras section or something similar along the lines of that where it wouldn't necessarily be a game but it might be like some some uh almost like encyclopedia or something about either the bad guys or the monsters or or whatever it may be and in need for speed 2's cases they have a a section from the main menu that you just go in to learn about the cars in the game. So they'll have clips of the cars, like video clips, images, the history of the cars, the history of the car company. So I'm like, man, this is this is a history, like true, true to life history forever captured in this video game. And what's also interesting to me is all the cars in this, game that was released in 1997 and mind you some of the cars featured in the game are from even before then are still really cool looking so they've got these these uh these supercars in this game that are are real world cars and some of them at the time costed close to a million dollars per car so when i was playing this game and playing as these playing with these amazing vehicles, I'm like, where are all these cars right now? 
like all these old Lamborghinis from like 1997 or or whatever kind of car it was, where are they? Are they sitting in somebody's collection? Are they all in junkyards? Like what happens to these hundred thousand, multi hundred thousand dollar cars, or even million dollar cars? 20 years later, 25 years later. That's a great point. I've never really thought about that. Yeah, because I know a lot of people collect like really vintage cars from like the 50s, 60s, and the 70s, but who's out there collecting cars from like 1995 and 1996? Like, is that old enough to be vintage yet? And is there really people who are seeking those out? And if I wanted one right now, how much cheaper would it be now that it's 2023? Can I afford a 1997, like, whatever? Uh, anyway, that, that thought crossed my mind when I was playing the yeah. game. Uh, but yeah, it was it's really a really fun game. It has multiplayer. It has an arcade mode, a simulation mode. And the only thing that's hilarious to me about that game is I don't think we realized how crappy those games looked back then and and, I, and this is coming from someone who loves the look of retro games but racing games in particular the draw disting distance is so short that you can literally see the track being like rendered as you're moving forward like the track only exists maybe 50 feet in front of you and then it's like it almost looks like it's being built as you're driving driving into it and yeah, we still have things like that today in modern games where the level of detail is lower farther away from your character and then as your character approaches it, a higher detail model kicks in. But back in the PlayStation 1 days, there was no lower detail model. Like it literally there was nothing there. It was just appearing out of nowhere. So that was kind of funny. It was, it was kind of hard to predict the turns because the track was being built as I was racing it, apparently. Yeah, I don't know if you remember. Uh, my. I guess my introduction to racing games was Cruisin' USA. I'm not sure if you remember those ones, but they were at a lot of the arcades, and I still play those now at the Beercades here in Chicago. They have, they've got a few of them in certain locations, and that's kind of a similar thing where it looks really crappy, and like, but like, there's so much nostalgia behind it and driving and everything. Like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how bad it looks. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So they have the vintage arcade machines, like the old old. They ones? do. Yes. Wow. Man. Yeah. They're See, that's that's one route I'll never go down collecting arcade cabinets because as much as I'd love to have like my basement full of arcade machines, they are so much work, so much maintenance. Most of them have been beaten to hell and need tons of repair and TLC to get them back in full functioning order. Especially pinball machines, like those are like the ones you should never collect. Yeah, yeah, the man. Yeah, it's a There's full so much time that can job. go wrong on a pinball machine. What did you say? There's so much that can go wrong on a pinball machine. Yeah, because yeah, it's literally just a metal ball bashing the inside of it. That's how the game works. So yeah, they get so much wear and tear. Yeah, if you own a pinball machine, it's like a full time job keeping that thing running. But anyway, yeah, the effort involved, the space needed, the money, like. I don't think I'll ever go down the rabbit hole of collecting arcade machines, but if I were to collect arcade machines, there are tons that I have on my wish list. And I remember, I don't know if you remember the bowling alley that was on, uh, what street was that? In uh, Mount Holly? I, I think it might have been the Mount Holly one, yeah. And they had they had a small arcade there. Mm -hmm. I think it was. Yeah, it was the Mount Holly one. Yeah, they had a small arcade there that I used to go and play games there all the time. And I went there and they had a NFL Blitz arcade machine. And mind you, I was only like 10 or 11. So I'm playing this game. It ate my quarter and didn't give me a game. So I went to the, the manager. I'm like, hey, the arcade machine ate my quarter. Like it didn't it didn't give me a game. And he's like, man, I'm so tired of that dang arcade machine breaking down all the time. He's like, if you got a way to get it out of here, you can have it. 
<laughs> so, so as an 11 year old, I'm like, I could have an NFL Blitz arcade machine and you're just going to give it to me? Are you serious? Are you joking? He's like, I'm serious. I want it out of here. It's, it's more trouble than it's worth. So when either my mom or my dad came to pick me up, I told him, I was like, can we take the arcade machine? First of all, we didn't have a truck. So we would have to go find somebody with a truck to haul this. And I think that was the first thing my mom or my dad said. They're like, how, how are we going to get it home? And second of all, no, you have a tiny bedroom where... Where are we going to put it? We're not lugging this giant arcade machine home. But that's a story about how I almost had an NFL Blitz arcade machine back when I was like 11 years old. That's a great story. I've got one from uh, my dad used to play in the band at the old, um, uh, I don't know where it was. It was, it was he had St. Patty's Day. He would always play at this same spot in Peoria. And it had arcade machine. It had a little back area with arcade machines as well. And like all the kids would need to go over there because it was still like smoking at the time in buildings so like the front area was just packed with smoke man so like all those kids are like chilling and eating popcorn by the arcade machines but i remember getting in fights like with other kids that were there over marvel vs. capcom 2 and just people like just trying to fight to get on the machine one and then two stay on the machine but yeah, a lot of good times with arcade, and I still I still frequent at the arcades here in uh, Chicago. But I just drink beer while I do it. <laughs> yeah, nice. All right, we uh, totally got off track, but that was that was a good chat. Anyway, let's uh, let's talk about our next topic. And speaking of man, we cover a lot of nostalgia stuff here. Like arcades, loved them, still love them. But another thing that we have a lot of nostalgia for is the Xbox 360. And I know I've talked about this to death already on the podcast, but I can't help it, man. I love the 360. It was it was the perfect console, had amazing games. So recently I was playing my Xbox 360 and Mitch, I happened to See that you were online because A, it's very fascinating to me that you can log on to the Xbox 360 and see that somebody's playing the Xbox One or the Xbox Series X. Like there's still interconnectivity because mm -hmm. I guess it, it, it's all st still the same Xbox Live network. And it's even fascinating to me that on Xbox 360, you can see your friend's activity from not only Xbox Series X, but also Game Pass on PC. So it was so weird looking through the activity and like seeing that you were playing whatever on Xbox Series X, or that I could even see that myself was playing Signalist on Game Pass yeah. in my own history. From the old, old Xbox 360 from all the way back in 2005. Anyway, back on topic. So I loaded up your profile and Xbox 360 has this cool feature where you can compare games with any of your friends. You can see what games you guys have in common, you can see your gamer scores, you can see who has a higher gamer score, and you can just see the games that your friend has played that you have not played. So I thought it would be fun if we went through your Xbox 360 history, because I played a lot of 360 games, but You've played games that I've never even played or even heard of, and I'm very curious what you remember about these games. What are some of your enjoyable memories? Is this game any good? Should I pick it up to add to my Xbox 360 collection? So it, it, It's almost embarrassing seeing this as many achievement points as I have compared to you at the top of the screen. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. Just, just for the people listening and not watching, I have about 31,000 gamer points. Mitch has 138,000 gamer points. So you got about 107,000 gamer points above me. And mind you, I've played well over 100 360 games, many of which I've beaten. So I don't know how you racked up that many points. I know when I was younger, I would hunt for them, and a lot of my friends would all hunt for them. But then, I guess as I've gotten older, I've really always 
Xbox has been my main console, so anytime I like usually play anything, it's 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 on the Xbox. Yeah. So anyway, I think these first couple that we're scrolling through are just ones that I've played, which I'm more curious. I know what I've played. I know those games. I'm more curious <laughs> about what you've played. So let me fast forward here until I get to the point where we're starting to see the ones that you've exclusively gamer played. So right now, Mitch, just so you can follow along, I am just about at the five minute mark okay. in this video. So here we go. Your games start here at about 4.45, four minutes and 45 seconds in. Got it. So for those listening, I shared the video I captured of this with Mitch so he can follow along. All right, right off the bat, way more sports games than me. I mean, you've played the Maddens, the, I guess, the 2Ks. I'm not huge into sports games. I see you've got uh, FIFA, all that stuff. But I'm not hugely interested in sports games, but there are a few that stand out to me. But before I dive into that, right off the bat, I'm seeing this game called Outpost Koloki X. Do you even remember what that is? You got 10 gamer points on it, so I don't think you got very far in it. I've never heard of I, it. The only thing I remember, I don't remember anything about the game, but I do remember how I played it. Uh, the Xbox Arcade had a collection of sorts where they put a bunch of Xbox Live Arcade games together in one disc. And okay. you could they and they sold it, and that was one of the games on it. I can't remember. It might have been like a space management sim of some sort. But yeah, obviously it didn't play it too much. Got it. And one of the sports games I do want to cover, because we were just talking about NFL Blitz. So I see Blitz the League. Now I've heard of this, and I've played all the old NFL Blitz, like on Nintendo 64, Arcade, PlayStation 1. I did not, I fell off after that. And I know they kept making them on PlayStation 2, Xbox, the original Xbox, and then PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. And I believe... They came out with Blitz the League, and then Blitz the League 2, and then after that it was the death of the series, and they never made any more games. Mm -hmm. So, were these games any good? Or were... Were they were? They were They were good, and they were, they were kind of dark, and a little bit like... Uh, they took a very interesting turn with the Blitz franchise, so they went away from... I don't think this one had licensed characters, or licensed um, players in it. So it's like made up characters and made yeah. up teams. Okay. From my understanding, I believe it. Maybe not the teams. I think it's actually, yeah, I think it was made up teams as well. And I understand why, because it was very dark. Like when you would like play, you know, with regular blitz, you, you can basically beat the crap out of somebody. Like they should be dead by the time. Like, yeah, the was violence the was jacked up. 10 times as it would be yeah. in real football. You've got a big running star and you are doing a freaking torpedo at somebody with <laughs> yeah. your helmet. But in this, it's similar where it's still that same like stuff. But in this one, they'll show, show slow motion bones breaking and like injuries that are happening. Whoa. So it'll almost x-ray the character when they sh when they get an injury and it'll just like go slow motion. And the bone just goes crack. And, Whoa. And, and there's other things like so if you're if your guy's injured, I think you could like get steroids and put them in your guy so that, that he could like continue going even on like very brutal injuries day so there was a it was like i think it was just get really kind of dark i want to say there was like steroids and drugs and like you know and a lot of brutal injuries and it makes sense why nothing was licensed wow see i can't picture any game company taking risks like that today making like an m-rated football game they would look at that on paper and be like, this will never make us money. Why would we make this? Nobody's going to buy this. So, yeah, I, I don't miss... know if anybody would have bought it if it didn't have the Blitz name in front of it, you know? Yeah. I'm going to have to check that one out. I miss a lot of these more arcadey sports games. Like, right above that, I see you have NBA Street Home Court. And, man, I used to love the NBA Street series. And I see you got a 1,000 gamer points on this, so you must have played a lot of that. Yeah, I actually have a memory on that one because one of the I wanted all the achievements on it because it was really fun. I loved the NBA Street games, and this one was a lot of fun. But remember, I think there's one achievement I have on there where you have to win ten online games in a row, 
and I and, and I did it, and I was like, and it's probably one of the most, one of the best achievements I've ever gotten in a game, or at least most impressive. <laughs> Dang. Nice. So yeah, I see more sports games. Um, let's see what else we got. Going I'm a big, on I'm a big Madden fan, big 2K fan. Yeah, I see the Madden, see the 2K, see Call of Duty 2. Um, yeah, Call of Duty 2 is really when my 360 time started. All right, so yeah, here I got a few questions. You got a bunch mm -hmm. of points in Marvel Ultimate Alliance. I've never played that. What, what is that game? Fantastic game. They actually have uh, HD like remasters on the Xbox 360 or the Series X now. I think it's an, it was for Xbox One, but it is a Marvel co-op, almost like beat 'em up of sorts. Hmm. So I guess think of maybe. I don't know. Think of maybe like a Ninja Turtles, like arcade game in a Marvel un universe, but a little bit more advanced with uh, with different like moves that you can use. And then there's like little synergies with characters that can do like if you've got Storm and you've got Wolverine, they can combine their powers and do something cool. So, but uh, was yeah. it um, was it local co-op or online co-op or both? It was both. So I remember a lot of times John, my friend John and I would play this exclusively. Like he'd come over and we would play local co-op. But then even more recently, him and I have been going back to it and playing uh, on uh, online since he's in California. Mm -hmm. So it's been it's been cool to go back. And uh, it's another one of those that's backwards compatible. And that's one that's, that still holds up to this day really well. And there's actually a second one of that, and then they released a third one of that that was exclusive to the Nintendo Switch. Hmm. And that was kind of weird, but... Did you play the second or third one? Second one, yes. The third one I have not played, no. Okay. Just because it was on Switch, and I didn't have any other friends that had it, and I was like, this is more for, like, a, you know, a co-op yeah. thing so than anything. So, would you say the second one was better? Yes. It was? I would okay. say the second one was better. It had, I get from what I remember, I think they just added, they really just built upon what was good in the first game and made it better. They didn't drastically change it by any means. And they added more heroes, I want to say, in the second one. So, I mean, they had a really big cast of Marvel characters. Like, you could play as, like, Ghost Rider and, like, Daredevil and, like, very obscure heroes sometimes, too. It was cool. So, was the second one also released on Xbox 360? Yes. Okay. And yes. So were you saying that they they re-released this on Xbox One, or they just made it backwards compatible with Xbox One? They re-released on Xbox One. Yeah, I was kind of confusing that. They re-released it, and then you could buy it as a as a pack of two. Like uh, you could buy both Marvel Ultimate Alliance One and Two together for I think it was like forty bucks at the time. Hmm. Was that released on PlayStation Four? I don't know. I'm about to find I can't out. remember if it was a 360 exclusive title or not. I don't see any PlayStation 4 one. So you said it was on Xbox One. Xbox One. I think it was only digital that ah, they did a boo. Maybe I'm not. I'm not positive on that. I mean, there was physical releases on the original games. Yeah. But the the remaster that they did and combined both of the. Yeah, I think you're right. It looks like it's digital only. Come on, man. I want that for my collection. Not that I have Xbox One those anyway. Are, but. Those are really cool games, though. They're they're a lot of fun to play co-op. All right, so this next one I got to ask about. So I rented this game because the box art looked cool. This game is called Vampire Rain. And I knew you were, were going to bring this up. When I went to play it, this is it was so terrible. I couldn't even get past the first enemy you encounter in the first level. Like, the first enemy immediately can outrun you, and as soon as he catches you, he kills you instantly. And I tried everything I could do to get past him, and after about 30 minutes, I was like, this is stupid, this game sucks, I give up. And then years later, I find out that this is one of the worst rated Xbox 360 games ever released, if not the worst. Matter of fact, let, let me look up this Metacritic score real quick, alright. Yeah, well, you're doing that. Rain. Yeah, this will we'll, we'll wait. I want to hear this. All right. Is it? I agree. It, it's a bad game, but I'll explain why I have 650 gamer score after the, uh, we check this out. Specifically, look at the Metacritic. All right. 
So this game holds a 38 on Metacritic for reviewer scores and a 3.2 on user scores. Now the reason I want to bring it up is because I don't just see that you've played it. Like me, I told you I played it for 30 minutes, got zero gamer score on it. You have 650 gamer score points on this. How much did you play this game? Not much, to be honest with you. I, I think the achievements were really, really, really easy to get. And the reason I'll say, so I bought this game, which I am, I was very upset that I bought this game, but it was one of those. Did, did you buy a brand like, new, like full price? Yes. 50, 100%. 60 dollars. Oh, yep. my, oh, my. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, my dad did. Shout out to my dad. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was too young to be buying that. Yeah. Why, why did you buy this game? Yeah. So my friend, uh, my good neighborhood friend, Taylor, uh, he had been hyping this game to our friend group in the neighborhood for so long. Like, guys, this is the coolest concept ever. Like, look at the look at the Game Informer magazine article on it. It looks awesome. And basically, it was like, everybody has to get it. It's got online play. We're all playing it. I'm like, all right, fine. We'll do it. And we get the game, and we only play the online on it. That's all I think I remember playing on that. And I think a lot of the achievements were based on that online. And I don't think I played much of it. I really think it was just really easy achievements to give me 650. I don't remember very much at all about that game. Got it. Dang. But yeah, you know, you know how it goes with some friends when they hype a game up, and then you're like, "Oh yeah, it sounds yeah, really good." And then they hyped up literally the worst rated game on the Xbox 360. Yeah. Shout out Taylor if he's if he's listening. <laughs> That's on you, bud. <laughs> All right, let's see what else we got here. Aegis Wing, e Aegis Wing, never heard of that. That's a great one. That's a great Xbox uh, Xbox arcade game. They gave that one for free. I think it was free. And it was like uh, side-scrolling, co-op, online, four-player, like, space shooter. Like, you're just, like, shooting a little, like, spaceship and almost like... It's almost like those Ninja Turtle-like levels when you're, like, on the skateboard or, like, in, or, like on, like, something like that. And you're, like, flying through the level trying to dodge things and shoot things. Yeah. Was it digital only? Was it arcade game? Did it was an arcade game, yeah. It was Xbox Live Arcade, digital only. Get really good, though. Can. I think I got every... I want to say I almost got every achievement on that, or did I? Nice. All right. Oh, I only got 180. But I think on arcade games, there were only 200 total. Now, you, you and I talked about this one. Kingdom Under Fire, Circle of mm -hmm. Doom. So this one... It, this one's the opposite of I think I I think maybe my friend Taylor again or somebody else somebody in the friend group our neighborhood group hyped this game up and I think I was pretty excited for it too. It was like a more like a fantasy co-op adventure game of sorts and we played online together and I I sunk I sunk quite a bit of time we all did actually and uh, got and that one was actually a pretty solid game and I think we might have looked up some metacritic stuff on that and it scored pretty decently. Yeah. I think that one actually got yeah. pretty mediocre scores, but you were telling oh, me crap. you were hyping it up. Hey, screw what everyone else thinks. If you like a game, you like a game. And uh, I remember I, us having fun on that. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember really anything about it now, but I I do recall we had fun. Now, before you and I talked about this game, I had I run into copies of that all the time, and so many times. It like used video game stores or uh, used bookstores. I see it for like five or six bucks, and every time I was like, I wonder if I should pick this up or not. And then I would look at the Metacritic scores, be like, eh, it looks mediocre, and I put it back. But it sounds like one of the best parts of it was that you played it cooperative cooperatively yes. with your buddy. But unfortunately, it does not have local co-op. It only has online co-op, and I'm pretty sure. Either the servers are probably long gone or there's nobody left to play the game with online. Yeah, probably not worth the pickup on your own unless it was just super cheap and you wanted to test it out. But yeah, I might have to look up some videos on that again and some old YouTube videos just to check it out. I just don't, I don't remember a thing about it. I just, I just know it was like a fantasy co-op adventure style game. Yeah. So, all right, you've got a lot of gamer points for Viva Pinata. And I have no idea what this is. It sounds weird. 
what the heck is Viva Pinata? And is it Viva Pinata a good game? is weird. It's a great game. No, it, it's a fantastic game. So it's actually developed by Rare, which Rare is now known for Sea of Thieves, which is their kind of their big ongoing game right now. But they're also very well known for other titles, like many Banjo other Kazooie. titles, many classic classic yes. titles. Golden Eye, Banjo Kazooie, um, Battle Toads, Perfect, uh, Perfect Dark, Perfect I mean, Dark. Man, the list goes on and on. Anyway, so many classics me. that they made their own collection and put it on a disc for 360. Like, there's you know, there's a ton of good stuff on there. But yeah, Viva Pinata is fantastic. It's an exclusive 360 game, and essentially, it's like a, it's almost like a farm. I guess maybe like an animal raising sim, but like the animals are actually like they're all pinatas. So they're different breeds of pinatas, and essentially you're like capturing pinatas, you're raising pinatas, then you're breeding them with you know other pinatas to make different pinatas. And <laughs> who yeah, came up with this concept? Dude, I don't know, but I remember playing it as a kid and really enjoying it. And I've actually dove into it a little bit uh, post. As I've gotten older, I wanted to check it out again, and they released, like I said, that Rare Collection, and that was part of the Rare Collection. Oh, it was in that? Okay, cool. Yeah, both Bio Piata 1 and 2 are in that collection, and it's on Game Pass okay. as well. And is the second one a good game, too? The second one is just as good. Yeah, they basically just expanded upon the first game. Another example of they didn't try to you know, reinvent the wheel. They, you know, they just added features to it. So, yeah, both were really good games and a lot of fun. Okay, the next one I want to ask you about is there's a million in one of those Co is it Cabela's Hunter games? Yeah, big game hunter. <laughs> like I always see those, and the first thing I think is this is like some budget hunter hunter game for a hunting game, and it never appealed to me at all. But I see that you've played Cabela's Big Game Hunter why and where and how and explain yourself mitch this is Dude, basically I, this what one i'm saying I, I do not even know because this is not up my alley in any shape or form i usually do not play any of these games even when i see them at bars you know how every bar has like a has a what is it the golden tea with the the there's usually has a golden tea and a big game hunter you know that's yeah, every yeah. you know dive bar in central illinois <laughs> although i will say if I remember correctly, they released a big game hunter zombie edition where all the animals were zombies and they were attacking you. That okay, one is that one I could get behind. I don't, it's, it's not a good game, but it is <laughs> when you're super drunk. It is so stupid and entertaining. But yeah. do you remember <laughs> playing this on Xbox 360? No, so I don't who remember knows how it got on your console. I'm going to guess that somebody had it like one of my friends had it and they brought it over and I was like, oh, yeah, I'll put it in the and check it out for a little bit and got a couple achievements and said, all right, this is pretty crappy. All right. The next one, though, I've been hyping you to play it or at least check it out, though. And which one's that? Oh, wait, never mind. Nope. Different game. I'm looking at Stranglehold. I was I was thinking of um, a different game. Never mind. We'll we'll approach it later on. I was going to say, because I, I played all the way through Stranglehold, and that is a great game. That is a great game, but it's not the one I'm thinking. <laughs> okay, keep going. Um, so I'm continuing on. More sports games. I see Unreal Tournament 2, The Orange Box, Classic Classic, Soul Calibur 4, Grand Theft Auto 4. Wow, you got must have gotten way Auto farther 4. than me in Grand Theft Auto 4. Uh, Rock the, Band. Yeah, beat Grand Theft Auto 4 for sure. Rock Band, Guitar Heroes, we talked about those last week. Rainbow Six Vegas, uh, one and two great games. Uh, let's see, Dead Space. Oh, yeah. Fantastic Silent Hill game. Homecoming. Oh, yeah. Mm hmm. Now we're in the good stuff. The yeah, good 360 Banjo, time right here. Banjo Kazooie, Nuts and Bolts, Saints Row 2, Rock Band. More Madden, more N NBA, more FIFA. So man, a lot, that, a lot of stuff. That was I've a played. good time in 360, though, man. Or yeah, time I mean, in 360. This is like we're in the booming area era now. Fallout 3. It looks like you might have beaten that. Sure did, and uh, DLC. Saints Row, Fear 2, uh, Left 4 Dead. Oh yeah, love me some Left 4 Dead. Oh, the skate games are fantastic as well. 
Okay, so this is one, this is one I recently had an opportunity to pick up a copy of. And this is legendary for the Xbox 360. It looked cool. I vaguely remember playing the demo for it on Xbox Live and thinking it was good, but it got horrible reviews. So I ended up putting it back and not purchasing it for my collection. I see you have a gamer score of 500 on this. So it sounds like you probably beat the game, if not almost did. Was this a good game? And should I have picked it up when I was given the opportunity? I'm trying I'm trying to remember my playthrough of it. I mean, I, I beat it. I know I did, and I know how I got it. So I, I think it was at a time where, like, obviously I played a ton of games, but I, I was at a time where I wanted games and I couldn't buy them because I didn't have enough money. So I was doing a free trial of what they called Gamefly. And Gamefly. Oh, Gamefly. Yeah. Still around, by the way, in some form or fashion, but... Yeah, Gamefly was a a service where you could essentially it was a game rental company, but they would mail you the games and you'd have to mail them back. Yeah, it was like the, it was like the Netflix of video games, right? The, yeah. Back when Netflix did the the mail in DVDs and stuff. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. Yeah, it was just like that. So, uh, Legendary was one of the games that I got, and it was like I want to explain what it was exactly it was like a crap i can't even explain like the era it was in it was more like think of like almost like hercules like i don't know like, but it was it was like a shooter where you're like shooting a lot of mythical creatures yeah, and whatnot that's, that's what i remember yeah it, it was basically a first person shooter with mythical creatures and some story that was wrapped around around it and I mean, I obviously, I, I don't know if I beat it because I just knew I had to return it. So I was just like, oh, I'm going to beat this game. You know, I only got a certain amount of time with it or it was actually good. I I, I beat it, so it must have been somewhat decent. Yeah. All right. Fun fact, we have the exact same gamer score on Batman Arkham Asylum. Man, that's one of the, that's probably a top 25 game for me. Yeah, same here. All right, what else we got? Um... Okay, I'm always shocked that this even exists as a game. Because to me, this does not sound like it would be that fun. And this is Paintball 2009. I'm at the 8 minute, 26 second mark yep. on the video. I'm right so, here. But you've got a, a high gamer score on it. I, I've never played a paintball game. It just, I don't know, I look at it and I'm like, oh, I'd much rather play Call of Duty or something where I'm shooting real guns. Like how was this game excellent actually I, really? I do remember it was one of those things though you got to have some friends to play it with okay so you you could actually team up with your friends on it and you could play against other people online and it was a ton of fun because it almost was like i don't know i mean call of duty had similar things with like search and destroy one life and such but like in paintball like if you get hit you're out so it was like you could like duck behind you know they they have all these like maps of different like bags that they put out in different scenarios on paintball fields and whatnot and you know you just had to you had to take out the other team it was very simple it was just like you're playing paintball regularly but like for some reason my friends and i just thought it was the most fun to do that online and play against other people like it it hmm. was interesting even like the campaign itself was fun i remember playing that there was a campaign a paintball campaign yes did it have a story and everything to go along with it I can't remember. I want to say it might have. Like, it was kind of like a, a maybe like going through the ranks and like taking your team to the top, you know, to beat all the other teams and whatnot. I'm not sure if there's a story or it was just more of like you just played against other teams and had a record or something like that. See, that's what fats, fascinates me about video games because there's these huge staple franchises that are the first thing people think about when they think about video games. Like, you know, Call of Duty, Halo, um, you know, or whatever the the main racing game is at the time. Um, all these sports Forza. games, Madden, 2K. There, there's these major franchises that people, when you say video games, it's the first thing you think of. But it always fascinates me that throughout all the history of video games, there have been so many game, very, very niche games that have been made about really weird topics 
And I always just wonder, like, who who was like, I'm going to make a paintball game. I'm going to make a Kentucky Derby game. I'm going to make a, a whatever it is. It's just these very strange things. I think it was the height of the nostalgics. I think there was, like, a really a specific time in our lives, or I guess our childhood, where paintball was, like, the next big thing. It was, like, it was huge. Everybody was, like... Yeah, I know in Peoria, there was a lot of people that go out to, like, I don't know where it was, maybe chill a coffee or yeah. something like that. And they'd be like, yeah, we're going paintball this weekend. They're, like, doing it every weekend, and they're like, it's so much fun. You know, I got my own gun that I paid, like, $400 for, and, like... Yeah. Yeah, so I think it was just the height of the popularity of paintball. Yeah. But, I mean, anything can be converted to a game. Anything that's already a game can definitely be converted to a video game. Absolutely. So... Yeah. All right. So, the, oh yeah, another game I've passed up a million times on picking up at used game stores is Infinite Undiscovery. I see that all the time. Is that any good? Yes. Uh, as a person who is a big JRPG fan, Infinite Undiscovery is a hundred percent that. If I believe it's a turn-based JRPG, if I do remember correctly, and there was a time where 360 had some of the best like obscure jrpgs that nobody really had ever heard of i think like during that time 360 was landing like some of my favorites like blue dragon was on there uh lost odyssey which i think i've talked about that's one of my favorite games of all time great jrpg like a lot of square enix like jrpgs got onto the 360 as exclusives and it's very it was a very weird time because that's just not the case these days yeah and and Infinite Undiscovery was one of them. I've never beat it, but it is one that I've kind of thought to go back to because it had an interesting story from what I remember. Hmm. All right, well, continuing on, right now I just see a lot of the common heavy hitters, Halo, Call of Duty, Gears of War, Assassin's Creed. Before you go any further, though, there, there's one that I want to highlight because it, it has so much nostalgia for me, and it's 1 vs. 100. Did you ever play one verse 100 no wasn't that a tv show or maybe it still is so it was a tv show but then xbox turned it into a live online video game so essentially there was certain times of the week where they would open this up and it would almost be like a live game show that you would tune into online and it was hmm. one verse 100 and essentially you would and you could win Microsoft points if you were good enough and you were fast enough answering these questions and staying within the 100. But it would be random because there's so many people turn tuning in. It can't just be, you know, you can't just be in the 100 every time. So there was always like a random and it was also like the, the height of like the me popularity, like the um, like your created character within the mm -hmm. Xbox 360 dashboard. Yeah, which was awesome. Yeah, so they use that. So all the characters that are in the audience are actual real people's little avatars, emotes yeah. or uh, avatars. There we go. And they were all in the audience and doing like random things. And there was always they they isolate a hundred people and they would put them into the one hundred, and those people could get like the grand prize and they would get they could get like a new console or like you know or like a controller or like a. They had a ton of giveaways and it was ran by i can't remember the guy's name he still does xbox stuff now larry uh larry herb or something like yeah, that I yeah can't think. him he would be the one that would be like the the host of one verse 100. Huh. so it was like really cool because my mom even got into it with me where she would be like are they going to do the trivia thing because my mom loves trivia so she would like sit down with me and help me with the answers and we try and uh, be fast enough and get them all right so I could win some Microsoft points. Dude, that sounds epic. I never knew Dude, they did it was, that. Uh, it has so much nostalgia with like my entire friend group that did it with me, and we have been clamoring for them to do something again like along those lines, and they just never have. But there was a rumor I think I saw that they were trying to bring something like that back here soon, so I'm hoping that's the case. Wow. That's cool. I wonder, I'm sure there's footage of that on YouTube somewhere. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, check it out. It was, it was, it was so much fun. All right, man. Continuing on. More common games. See, so you played Uno quite a bit. 
<laughs> kind of a surprising <laughs> one. Worms. You told me before you loved the Worms franchise. Uh, okay. I've got a Nuno story for later, but we'll we'll save that for another our, our next topic. Okay. Um, all right. So this this one I'm curious about. The Sims Three. Did you play a lot of The Sims on Xbox 360? You got quite I a bit of gamer Sims. On. I played The Sims since I used to borrow my stepdad's laptop and play it on, on you know, on the computer because you know I loved playing The Sims and it was originally only on the computer, mm-hmm. and they finally moved it over to consoles. And yeah, I play. I think I played a decent amount of that one, and it it ran. I mean, it didn't operate or didn't run as well, or I guess it wasn't the same type of Sims as the computer ones were but it was very good i never knew that never knew you played the sims yeah i was a big sims fan my dad wouldn't let me get uh they used to have like expansions all the time and one of the expansions was called like uh the sims making love or something like that and you wouldn't get it for me because of the name of the title (laughs) (laughs) oh i don't blame him though i'm sure it was like super PG and like toned down if it's The Sims. They blurred out everything that was, you know, crazy to yeah, <laughs> like if they're out everything. Or something. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so continuing on. Yeah, more heavy hitters, man. Battlefield, Dead Space, more Assassin's Creed. I mean, there was yeah. a million Assassin's Creed released on the 360. Uh, now Remember, we're getting into a lot more Connect games, Dance Central, Connect Sports. Just Dance. Uh, I see your DJ Hero we talked about last week. Mm-hmm. Dead Island. Man, Dead Island 2 just came out, but the first yep. one I absolutely love. That is such a cool game. And I think that's the first game is really, really underrated in my opinion. Absolutely. It's an open world co-op zombie game. And the fact that that was... I played it on PC, but the fact that, that was, they were able to release that game on 360 with the aging hardware at the time and do that much with 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 the 360 hardware it absolutely blows my mind yeah super impressive uh then bullet storm freaking love that game another one i played on pc though not on 360 uh here we go more call of duties more halos bunch of great halos the the remaster of halo one that was great halo reach was good very different but it was still a great halo game uh, Fable 2, did you finish that? Because you got a lot of points oh, yeah. on that one. Yep, love the Fable series. Uh, Forza Motorsport 4. So we talked about the Forza series. So did you play yeah. Fable, Fable 2 and Fable... Th- Wait, did you play Fable 1, 2, and 3? Well, only 1 and 2. Okay. I actually have been thinking maybe I should go back and just beat 3 because I've heard it's a great game too. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if you like the first one and the second one. Yeah, and it's a backwards compatible title, and I do own it on uh, Xbox 360. Well, there you go. And I yeah. think, I wait, when you played Fable 1, did you play it on the original Xbox, or did you play the remaster they released on Xbox 360? I played the original on the original Xbox. Okay, because they did re-release it as Fable Anniversary on the Xbox 360. Yes, I think that is uh, also backwards compatible, which is nice. All right, got some other good games. Uh, Battlefield 3, Resident Evil 5. I got a funny story about Resident Evil 5. <laughs> so, I was talking about Resident Evil. When did we do that? Yeah, I mean, I don't know, man. <laughs> so when Resident Evil 5 came out, I liked it, and I definitely wanted to play it split screen. Or I definitely wanted to play it co-op. And I think at the time, I was playing it co-op through split screen. And I was staying with my dad and in the room I was staying in well actually I think at the time all the TVs he had were still CRT tube TVs and the TV he had in the room I was staying in was so old and it was so bright it was totally blown out the colors are blown out. The contrast is blown out. Saturation, everything was blown out, and it was so bright, it it would like burn my retinas if I stared at it for too long. Like just, it would it would give me a headache. It was that bad, and 
you can imagine I'm trying to play video games, which you'll sit there and play video games for hours. And every time I had to like force myself to, to play through a headache just so I could play video games on this horrible, horrible CRT TV. <laughs> That's devotion right there. And uh, yeah, and, and the Xbox 360 looks terrible on the CRT. And man, I remember trying to play Call of Duty on it. And it was just, it could could barely see off in the distance because it plus the TV was tiny. So yeah, me and me and a buddy tried to play Resident Evil 5 on split screen on this tiny blown out CRT. <laughs> I remember after like an hour, my friend was like, I gotta stop. <laughs> and he's like, I can't do it. <laughs> It's like it's making me dizzy. I can't tell what's going on. <laughs> I mean, me, I was used to it, so I was I was yeah. powering through it. But he was like, I can't do it, man. It's, this TV sucks too bad. <laughs> I remember being in my in my dad's basement. We had we had a big tube TV down there. It was super heavy. Like I remember trying to haul it out with my dad, and I almost threw out my back. And um, I don't even. My dad probably threw out his. But I remember it would. The color would go out on it periodically to where it would look like the original Xbox dashboard. Like the colors would be that green and black on like everything. So what I would have to do like is like go up to it and just smack it real hard <laughs> on the side of the TV. <laughs> and then, See, that's the thing. Like the colors would come back. Nowadays, flat screen TVs, I mean, pretty much they either work or they don't. Like back then, your t yeah, those tube TVs, yeah, you, if it wasn't working, you just smack it and then usually that fixed it. Like, how is that fixing it? How is this smacking the TV fixing it? But yeah, you're right. Man, so many people would just go up, smack their TV. Uh, yeah, it worked like a charm every time. Just dupe and uh, then all the colors come back. <laughs> Uh, how did you figure out that that was the fix? Like, <laughs> I think I'm just mad at Halo probably or something. <laughs> just rage. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to smack this and see what happens. Dang. All right, man. I think we're coming towards the end. More heavy hitters. Gears of War 3. Modern Warfare 3. Um, Bayonetta. Man, I freaking love that game. I need to go back and play that again. Yeah, I don't think I ever beat it. I need to go back as well. Batman Arkham City. Great sequel to a great game. Yeah. Soul Calibur 5, Halo 3. Holy crap, you You got a lot of gamer points on Halo 3. You must have played that to death. I yep, yeah, uh, aside from Halo 2, it's probably one of my most played games ever, I'd say. I beat that campaign on every difficulty. Okay, so another one you've got a lot of points in, and this is another game similar to Dead Island that very much impresses mm. me what they were able to do on the xbox 360 and that's borderlands yes you know a lot of the the mechanics that were created in borderlands have been redone to death in other games but when that game first came out that was pretty fresh and the ability to have a huge open world co-op shooter like that man that was that was quite the experience to have on console back then now it's a dime a dozen but it was like the first game to like really highlight and just say, you could have as many guns as you want. We have like over, we have thousands of variations of guns in this game. And I mean, there were all kind of slight variations of like maybe like 10 or 20 standard guns, but like they had so many different like variations of it. They all looked like very different guns. Like one could be the same shotgun that you had, but it like had maybe some poison ammo, had a different kind of scope on it. So, like, yeah, there were so many different variations that it made it really fresh, and, like, they really highlighted that, and it worked. Yeah. All right, so next after that, I forgot about this. They made an Xbox Live Arcade NFL Blitz game back on Blitz. I never played it. Was it good? Yes, yeah, so that one was not like the League where it got very dark and... You know, this this one was fully licensed, had all of the players, had all of the teams, and it operated just like a NFL Blitz arcade cabinet. And it was an Xbox Live arcade exclusive. So yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. Hmm. And had online, uh, you could play online with it. Nice. And this is an odd one. Sonic Adventure. I thought that was just a Sega Dreamcast game. That was really yeah. re-released on Xbox 360. Yeah, and still, uh, when I'm looking at my games on my Xbox now, it's still a backwards compatible title, so you can still play it now on, on 
current gen Xboxes. Huh. All right, man. We got just got a little bit more uh, Happy Wars. What's that? I think they gave that away for free. I want to say it was a. Uh, I think it was like a not a tower defense, but it was more like a dynasty warriors esque like hordes of like little guys like running in and trying to take out a tower or something it, it was all multiplayer too though it was weird hmm. all right so that one, one is the one uh sorry not to cut you off but sleeping dogs is the one that i was thinking of instead of stranglehold that's the one i was like you oh, gotta yeah, beat yeah. that game okay they re-released it on xbox one yeah, and it's uh, but it's also a 360 title, and yeah. fan fantastic game it runs just like a Grand Theft Auto, and I, they did it so well. Yeah, I'd much rather play that on Xbox One or PlayStation Four as opposed to the 360 version. I mean, if I can have it yeah. at 1080p, 60 frames per second, then that's the way Absolutely. I'd rather really go about it. I thought about replaying it with on xbox my xbox series x just to get that 1080p 60 all right man gotham city imposters i never played that was that any good i know this is one that you highlighted on our notes and that uh one that i really wanted to talk about because it, it was a ton of fun it was i think a 4v4 competitive shooter but like you it was basically v villains versus heroes it was like a bunch of jokers versus a bunch of batmans and like you could like do some ridiculous like like customizations and like little power-ups and different types of guns i think there was like grapples but there was also like joker like traps that you could place down and like it was so ridiculous because it was gotham city imposters so it's all these like little like people that were wannabe batmans and wannabe jokers some of them are like super fat and looking ridiculous and others are like super like scrawny and short and it, it was just a ridiculous game but it was like it, it ran and played really well it was a good shooter it was, hmm. it was it was a lot of fun all right next one is nba jam ofe what is that another one just like the arcade cabinets of nba jam it was based it was just that it was the it was those arcade cabinets um that they put into a Xbox Live Arcade game. Because there also was another NBA Jam game released on Xbox 360. Uh, it might have been the same game. Classic. So that's NBA Jam On Fire Edition. Yeah, I think, I think I have played that. I think they released it, like actually on a physical copy outside of uh xbox live arcade i think i played that all right so let's see banjo kazooie man you got a lot a lot of gamer points on that did you beat that on 360 i did yeah i went back i beat it on 360 i think i've beaten it on nintendo 64 but i wanted to play it again and i beat it oh, again so it, it is the nintendo 64 version yep and it is also now part of the rare replay collection and when you played it, was that something they had released on Xbox Arcade? Yes. Yep. You could just buy it directly from Arcade. And I think at that point, because the Rare Replay Collection was originally an, Arc, an Xbox 360 disc that you could buy. Hmm. That they think they made also for Xbox One. All right, man. Well, that looks like it is the end of the list. Man, that was expansive. I mean... We went through. Oh, there's Code Veronica X right at the top. There Most it recently is. got played a lot of achievements you. on that one. <laughs> Seven hundred gamer points. Nice. Uh, but yeah, anyway, man, yeah, over three hundred titles. Well over three hundred titles between the two of us on three sixty. I mean, that was uh, quite a time in my life to be gaming, and I had a little more free time than I do now, so I was playing a lot. Around yeah, you can tell looking at my achievements from because if you look at the very top of that, what you were looking at, you can see all of my Xbox One game achievements, and it's not even half of what I got on 360 titles. Yeah. 
So yeah, also don't have as much time to game anymore. <laughs> and we're playing on other cons- consoles. I that's think it. when the 360 came out, it was such a monumental console that that's that's what I did most of my gaming on. It was like 90% Xbox 360 and then maybe like 10% PC. But that was the ratio back then. But now the tables have turned. I play a lot more on PC now. I play a lot more Same. PlayStation 4 in, in retro consoles and all that stuff. So, But at that, at that time, 360 was king. It really was. Great console. We've talked about it a lot, how good that console was. They just... Red ring issues aside, just everything else was perfection on it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We, we have much more to cover on the 360, but we're going to save it for our next episode because we are well over the one hour mark. That was that was a deep dive into into our gaming history with the 360. Uh, yeah, I hope you all enjoyed the, the 360 nostalgia as much as as much as we do. Yeah. And let us know your memories of the 360 because it's so many great games an amazing online service man yeah good yeah times. i know some of you that listen have played a lot of these 360 tiles with me so send us either text me or send us an email at uh, hills or silent at gmail.com and you know we'll read them out on the on the pod i mean it'd be it'd be cool to hear some of your guys memories as well because you know i, I have a, quite a few but uh, i'm sure there's some that i'm that i'm forgetting that that would be nice to hear yeah all right well, thanks everybody for tuning in You can find us on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. And we've got other social media platforms we're on. Mitch, what are those? Yep, you can find us on our Twitter, at The Hills Are Silent, our Instagram, which is Instagram backslash Hills Are Silent. Our TikTok is at The Hills Are Silent Podcast. Our YouTube, again, is at The Hills Are Silent. If you have any questions, comments, and Xbox 360 memories, anything like that, we can go to our email inbox at hillsersilent at gmail.com. We'll catch you on the next episode.